All right. So yeah, let's let's go ahead and dive in. Um, we so this is a presentation on the state of Ethereum governance, and I gave this presentation at a Koala uh, event a few days ago, and it was pretty well received. And so we're really excited to share the same presentation um, now publicly, and it'll be recorded as well for posterity. Uh, why don't Why don't we go ahead and dive into introductions? And while you guys do the introductions, I can try to sort out this echo thing I'm seeing on my side. William, do you want to go first? Sure. This is William Ogayar, based in Toronto on my way to New York. Presently, I've been involved with Ethereum since day one, literally, and uh, I'm also the author of the, the business blockchain. I'm very interested in blockchain governance uh, as a whole. I'll go next. Uh, I'm Santiago City. I'm from the Democracy Earth Foundation. I've been involved with Ethereum, I guess, uh, as, a, as an ETH holder for the last uh, three years at least. Um, and uh, I, I'm very much interested in the field of, of governance as well. Hi everyone, I'm Christy Ford. I'm a law professor at the Allen School of Law in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, although currently I'm a Rodel Fellow at the European University Institute in Florence, Italy. Uh, my main areas of uh, writing and scholarship and teaching have been around regulatory theory, especially as it connects to financial innovation in particular. Thanks, Christy. I'll jump in. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Phoebe Tickell, and I'm um, a part of the DGov Foundation and also a member in Spiral. Um, I'm very interested and in, involved in the field of distributed governance, uh, especially on the soft governance side. So helping organizations and groups um, with practices and tools and kind of norms for distributed non-hierarchical and horizontal governance. Hey everyone, since we're at DGov, I might actually go next. So my name is Anya Blay. I'm a lawyer um, working on a master thesis about global law. There's quite a lot of analogies with the governance state of Ethereum and all the rest of the blockchain. Mm, I've co-organized the first DGov council as well. So working with Phoebe on that and otherwise based in Slovenia. All right, thanks guys. I think uh, that was everyone. Georgi, sorry, go ahead. Oh yeah, no, that's fine. Uh, so my name is Georgi Ismaev and I'm from Technical University of Delft in the Netherlands. And I'm doing research on ethics of technology um, with some particular focus on blockchain developments. So I'm very excited to, to engage into this discussion. Thank you guys very much for the intros. Um, yeah, so I guess I'll speak a little bit more about what Koala is later. Um, basically, it is a group which has existed for a few years, which brings together uh, so, so experts and scholars from fields, like some of the, the wonderful folks who have joined us here, things like legal studies, obviously, but also philosophy, ethics, conflict resolution, things like that. And I felt for quite some time as a, as a practitioner and non um, non-expert and non-academic, you know, who bumps up against many of these topics in the day-to-day -day, uh, work I do on Ethereum, um, that, that we really desperately need to learn from folks such as these. And so thank you all again very, very much for joining. Um, I think Koala is a really wonderful platform to uh, further that sort of engagement going forward. And I, I felt very honored to be a part of that, that group last week. And, and I'm looking forward to sharing some of what we discussed and some of our findings here. Um, so let's go ahead and dive into this presentation in the interest of time. As I said before we started broadcasting and recording, let's, let's make this participatory. So like, please jump in anytime if you guys have any questions. I'm going to, all right, so you should be able to see the slides again. Do you guys see the slides? Yeah, it works. All right, excellent. <laughs> um, yeah, so... So this is a presentation, as I said, that was given at uh, this Koala Summit a few days ago. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and walk through it now. And um, there's, there's a little bit of additional material we added at the end uh, where we can share some of what our working group discussed. Um, so I'm Lane. I am a core developer on the EWASM team. 
um, but I've been thinking a great deal about governance and, and learning a great deal about it alongside um, folks such as the others on, on the call today. Um, and I guess what else I can say about this presentation, it's 90% practice and only about 10% theory, although I guess the theory needle may move slightly up um, with the input of uh, the other um, researchers and, and uh, more experienced people we have joining us. Uh, so this is an outline of what we'll discuss. So we'll briefly start with some history about Ethereum. Um, we'll present a snapshot of how its governance functions and kind of dysfunctions today through a series of challenges and um, case studies. So, so trying to present all those things in context. We will briefly touch upon connection of some of these challenges we're facing in Ethereum governance to different fields and disciplines, including, again, things like governance and legal studies and political science, um, ethics, etc. We'll present a set of recommendations uh, going forward, things to think about, some ideas, uh, and then we'll briefly give a sort of glimpse of some of those findings from the working group. And we'll save time for questions at the end. Uh, this is if, if all the software is working, we should be live on Twitter. If any of you on the call want to verify by going to twitter.com slash LRetig, um, you should see a live stream there. Uh, and so hopefully we can take questions there as well. Just checking here I have, okay. Yeah, we have a chat window open as well from Twitter. Cool. So let's start with some history. So this is a very, very brief snapshot of sort of the Ethereum timeline up to and including the present. Um, and the main point I want to make with this slide is just that Ethereum is very, very young, right? The main net went live only in 2015. Uh, a lot has happened since then. There have been a few network upgrades, et cetera. Um, but uh, it's, it's sort of the, the set of stakeholders has grown enormously recently. It's a very, very I heard some audio. I think someone got checked the stream. Is that, is that working? <laughs> cool. Um, yep, so I thought it'd be fun to start with a slideshow and just kind of present visually a little bit of uh, what the social evolution of Ethereum has looked like these past few years. So um, quick disclaimer, I've been told that a couple of these early slides are slightly out of order, but uh, I'm exercising some poetic um, license here to, to tell a story. Uh, so basically, this is how Ethereum started in early 2014. Uh, quickly grew to include a few more stakeholders, uh, still entirely men. Um, this is DevCon Zero, which I believe happened in Berlin in 2014. So again, we have something like an order of magnitude growth in the number of stakeholders. This is DevCon 1, which was the first public DevCon. This happened in London in 2015. This is DevCon 2, which happened in Shanghai in 2016. So again, quite a bit of growth, a bit more diversity, which is a good thing. This was DevCon 3, which happened in Cancun, Mexico in 2017. This was uh, my first Ethereum event. Can no longer kind of fit everyone into a single photo, even like a wide angle photo. And this was the most recent DevCon 2018 uh, in Prague last autumn. And again, I really do think a photo tells a thousand words and I think the community has become much more kind of orderly here. This is one of the core devs meetings from early 2017. Um, again, uh, to be perfectly explicit, there's a little bit of um, poetic license here. This was like early in the call and I think a few other people joined later. There are no images of the calls from as far back as, or, or I should say video recordings of the calls from as far back as 2016. But to put this in context, this core devs meeting has happened every two weeks since around 2016. And it's, um, we'll talk more about how it fits into Ethereum governance later, but it is one of our kind of relatively formal governance mechanisms. Um, and at this point in time, as you can see, there were five people on the call. And if we fast forward a little bit, this is a much more recent call. I think this was actually an Ethereum 2 call, but you can see there's 38 people on this call. Some of the more recent calls, I believe, have even gotten into the 50s. So again, just to show, you know, you have people here representing many projects, many perspectives, many different geographies around the world. Uh, the diversity is really great, but 
as you might expect, as the number of voices and the number of stakeholders has increased rapidly, um, coordination has gotten harder as well. This is um, the Ethereum, the Fellowship of Ethereum Magicians. This was one of the first events. This was last summer, I believe, in Berlin. And um, just, just putting this up to show that, so, so the Fellowship of Ethereum Magicians is basically a grassroots effort that was started by uh, two gentlemen, Jamie Pitts and Greg Colvin. Greg is the, the gentleman on the right there holding the microphone. Um, and it's a way to kind of democratize Ethereum's technical governance. So it's an open forum, no strict membership, loosely modeled after the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, again, a lot more kind of diversity in input and voices here, which is, which is good, but again, making coordination a bit more challenging. Uh, this was a breakout session at DevCon focused specifically on the topics of diversity and inclusion. And I'm putting this slide up because uh, I think it's a big step forward for Ethereum. It was the, the very first sort of official recognition of the fact that you know, Ethereum is, is, a, is a platform for people everywhere and that it's important that we have input from as wide a variety of, um, you know, of voices and people with different backgrounds as possible. Cool. I'm just quickly checking if we have any, okay, I don't see any comments on Twitter. So let's um, discuss how Ethereum governance is working today. And any other comments or questions on that first section before we move on? Okay, cool. So the first point I wanna make here is that there's an important distinction between governance of and governance by blockchain uh, this is a point that um, folks, including uh, Primavera of, of Koala, have, have made in, in their talks in the past, and I like to start with this. You know, for, from my perspective, what makes Ethereum so exciting is, is the potential for using Ethereum to govern other sorts of human institutions. So things like, it could be anything. It could be money. It could be, um, it could be you know, ventures or enterprises. It could be more complex institutions like uh, sort of, you know, court systems, things like that. Um, however, in order to be able to do that, it's very, very important that the blockchain itself be well governed and, and be stable, uh, act as a stable foundation for building these other sorts of um, institutions on top of. And so this talk is going to be focused on the first point here, governance of blockchain. Um, yeah, that should be pretty clear. So I think the very first interesting question to ask when we talk about sort of something like governing Ethereum is like, what exactly are we governing? Because the term Ethereum is a bit overloaded and refers to a bunch of different things. I won't go through all of these in detail right now, um, but I do want to highlight the two main ones that we're talking about, right? And that is the protocol and the blockchain itself. And there's a distinction here. So the protocol is kind of the, the set of code that each of the different Ethereum client implementations agree to implement so that they can talk to one another and function as a single network. And uh, the protocol is kind of the process by which blocks are added to the blockchain. And the blockchain itself is kind of that data structure that gets built up over time. So when we talk about governance in the context of, of this conversation, we're talking about governing both changes to the protocol, i.e. changes to how we add blocks to the chain, as well as governing the chain as it exists. Uh, again, I won't go through all of these, but I'm just throwing this up here to show, again, how kind of diverse and complex Ethereum has become. So there's more than a dozen implementations of Ethereum 1, which is the Ethereum that's running today. And uh, we also now have something like nine implementations of Ethereum 2, which is the next generation of Ethereum. So again, lots of different uh, teams around the world building this, um, which, which is fantastic, right? The Ethereum ethos, unlike projects like Bitcoin, is to have a lot of diversity in our implementations. It allows us to, to catch bugs and, and hopefully work towards um, a more robust uh, protocol, but it, it makes, again, coordination among all these projects quite challenging. So looking at the way Ethereum is governed today, I feel pretty strongly that it exhibits aspects of each of these uh, systems of governance, and you'll notice that uh, democracy is not on this list, right? We'll come back to that later. Um, I, I had a, a tweet thread about this a few weeks ago. And, you know, again, I won't go through all of these, but some of them should be fairly obvious, some of them less obvious, right? So plutocracy, uh, you know, to a large extent, um, resources are, are controlled by, by a very uh, small set of influential, and, and, uh, influential individuals and groups that um, 
you know, that uh, make a lot of decisions and exert a lot of uh, influence in the community. Uh, technocracy, because we have this set of core developers who, um, uh, who, who make kind of the, the, those final decisions about what makes it into the client implementations. Uh, I'll highlight theocracy. This is slightly tongue in cheek, slightly serious. Um, you know, I, I do think that there are um, many people in the community who regard the opinions and the decisions made by certain individuals and certain organizations as uh, sort of sacrosanct. And, um, you know, so I think we, we exhibit some characteristics of, of, of this one as well. Uh, and, and I did, did put these all up here, you know, quite, quite seriously. Um, meritocracy, you know, there's definitely cases of folks who joined the community relatively recently and, and um, have gained a significant, um, I guess, people kind of take what they say quite seriously um, because they have demonstrated competence. <clears throat> And this last one here, I'll just mention because some people may not be familiar with the term ergotocracy. So this is, uh, this is governance by the workers, by labor. And the reason I put this up here is because miners uh, play an important role in Ethereum governance and, and kind of the extent to which uh, they ex exert influence, let's say over Ethereum governance is a bit open for interpretation. But um, again, they, they do play a very important role in governance and, and we would not be adding blocks to the chain if we didn't have um, miners mining. So that's definitely part of our governance. So I'd like to do a little detour here and just introduce the IETF for folks who may not be familiar with it. The IETF is the Internet Engineering Task Force, and it is a nonprofit international organization that is responsible for governing many of the protocols that underlie the internet. So these are things like TCP IP. Um, IETF has played a very crucial role in developing the internet and getting it to kind of where it is today. And um, the main part of this I want to highlight is the part I put in bold, which is that we try to avoid policy and business questions as much as possible. Uh, so while, while in, in some loose way, Ethereum governance is modeled after IETF and, and, and some organizations like the Ethereum magicians are more explicitly modeled after IETF, it sort of explicitly says that it, it doesn't want to touch upon things like policy and business. And that's becoming increasingly a challenge for Ethereum because um, more and more of the challenges and the hard questions that we face are in fact of that variety. Uh, and this is even more explicit. So this was um, one of the uh, early and most influential members of the IETF, David Clark. He said, we reject kings, presidents, and voting. We believe in rough consensus and running code. I, I think it's very important to highlight this because I do think in many ways, um, it's very influential to the governance of projects, including Ethereum. You know, We feel quite strongly that we do not want to have individual powerful decision makers, uh, and explicitly things like voting as well, because we feel that, uh, I don't know, they're kind of suboptimal. They're kind of not in line with our values and our principles. And in particular, they're, especially in the context of the internet and the pseudonymous network like Ethereum, they're subject to things like capture, which I think scare us quite a bit. And, um, you know, it, it's very easy when talking about governance to say, hey, why don't we have voting along these lines or along that lines? But this is one of the constraints that we're working with. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's important to highlight it up front. Again, feel free to jump in if you guys have any additional thoughts to add or questions about this, this, this topic. So the IETF, the main output of the IETF are these things called RFCs, requests for comment. And in fact, they feel so strongly and so explicitly about things like uh, rough consensus, which actually is a term that they came up with that they've actually formalized it into this particular RFC, 7282, which I highly recommend reading uh, if you haven't seen it already. Uh, so the way that they come to rough consensus in these working groups is via this process of humming, which sounds a little ridiculous. Um, I don't know if this video will work, but I'll try. Can you, can you guys hear the audio here? Not really. You guys do not hear the audio from this video? No. Okay. It is good to hear it, so. <laughs> yeah, it's a really cool video. Uh, that's, that's fine. Um, let me just bring this back to full screen. Okay, cool. So I did show this video. What was that? We can just imitate the humming. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe we should do it here. 
So I did show this video uh, when I did this presentation the first time, and it, it was really exciting to see it uh, because I'd heard about this humming and I'd never actually seen a video of it before. Um, so I, I will share this link and I'll, I'll share this entire slide deck actually so folks can actually watch this, or I guess you could try Googling it. Um, but the point is you have a room full of people here and they're asking this question, do you support or do you, um, yeah, do you support adoption of this, this proposal or that proposal? And, and what happens is everyone in the room just hums to show support. So, so no explicit voting. Uh, one of the reasons they use humming is because the range of volume that a person can hum at is, is rather limited. And so most people's sort of maximum hum is quite similar to one another. Um, yeah, so it's, 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 it's used as a way to kind of quickly gauge the temperature of a room and basically the idea of rough consensus is that it allows individual concerns to be addressed um, but still maintain momentum and move forward efficiently with decision making. And so when the chair, and there's these two gentlemen here sitting at the front of this room, when the chair feels that all objections have been raised and, and sufficiently addressed, then consensus can be gathered using humming. So the reason that I spend so much time talking about this is because we use something very, very similar in Ethereum governance on the core devs calls. Uh, I showed some images of those a little while ago, and we'll go more into that and, and show how it fits into Ethereum governance. Do you guys want to hum or should we just keep moving? <laughs> <That's good. laughs> cool, sorry, I'm just checking the software to make sure. Okay, I think we're good, cool. So I'm gonna keep moving. So um, another important point about Ethereum governance is that it all happens off chain with one exception and that is the gas limit. So the miners actually vote in protocol as part of the protocol to adjust the gas limit up or down. And uh, what this, this basically has to do with the throughput of the network, the number of transactions that it can process um, per block or per second. And so that's kind of quite cool. Not everyone is aware of this. The mechanism has worked quite well. It was raised via this kind of on-chain mechanism up to 8 million, which is the current limit at the end of 2017, when the network first became congested around the time of the CryptoKitties. And the reason it stayed at that limit up to now is because um, that's sort of more or less the maximum safe limit of the network right now while we work on scaling it more te technologically. So I, I made an attempt here to map out the sort of governance processes or mechanisms in Ethereum, and I'm definitely not going to go through all of these, but the point I want to make here is that we have very, very limited formal mechanisms and a lot of informal ones, which is by design, of course. Uh, I listed the all-core devs on both of these because while kind of the fact that it exists and the role that it plays in governance is quite formal, right? These calls happen every two weeks. There are many aspects of it that are quite informal, such as exactly who is invited to join the calls, um, you know, the, the, the exact definition of a core developer, the exact process by which decisions are made. It's kind of a rough consensus um, mechanism. I also listed some of the stakeholder groups in Ethereum governance from my perspective. So uh, this is a bit more balanced, right? We have this set of relatively formal institutions or organizations, things like the Ethereum Foundation, Consensus Parity, Web3, uh, infrastructure teams. Those are both, some of them are for-profit, some of them are non-profits. Uh, companies or foundations. And then we have quite a large group of informal groups of stakeholders. And this, this list is growing, which I think is quite exciting. Uh, I included kind of the community at the bottom here as a bit of a catch-all term. A couple of slides here just showing a little bit what this EIP process looks like. Um, and also to be clear, I included sources for these in the notes of the slides. I should have included them in the slides themselves. I'll try to make those more explicit. Um, one of these, I think this one actually comes from EIP1, which lays out the EIP process. So this kind of shows a little bit of the flow chart here of the different states through which EIPs can flow. The EIP process, which stands for the Ethereum Improvement Proposal process, is the one formalized governance mechanism, all protocol changes have to flow through this process. It's actually modeled after the Bitcoin improvement proposal process, which is in turn modeled after the Python improvement proposal process. I believe this slide comes from Vlad Zamfir. This shows how the EIP process fits into the broader governance. And the main point I want to highlight, so, so Geth and Parity here are the two main Ethereum clients. We could, of course, add the other clients there in that kind of column too. 
the main point I want to highlight here is both that the core devs mechanism, which is the, the second column from the right, that, that singular kind of bottleneck, right? That acts as a bit of a bottleneck because all changes need to flow through it. Also that um, the core developers, how do I put it? They're not explicitly bound by the output of the EIP process. And that's indicated by that thin arrow from roadmap to core developers here in this particular flowchart. The point is that just because an EIP makes it to the approved state, there's some back and forth and the EIP editors, as you saw on this slide, um, can help get that to a final state. Just because an EIP is final does not mean it's necessarily going to make it into a client nor is it the case that only final EIPs make it into client implementations. Um, the core developers actually are free to choose any EIPs they want to implement in their clients. And in the interest of the protocol and in the interest of avoiding contentious hard forks, it's almost always been the case historically that EIPs flow through that EIP process uh, and reach the final state before being implemented in the clients, but it's not necessarily and not necessarily always the case. This is another chart, which I believe comes from Dan Finlay and uh, lays out a very similar process. The main thing I wanna highlight here is the very top part, right? This shows what happens if that consensus formation does not happen, right? And there's two ways we can arrive at a contentious hard fork. The first is if um, not all the clients choose to implement a particular change, right? So some clients decide to and some clients decide not to. Uh, that has not happened in Ethereum historically. And the second is if miners or users don't uh, choose to install updated software, updated client implementations. And so that just kind of shows the, the series of vetoes that can happen here, right? Even if uh, an, a proposal moves through this entire EIP process and core devs process and gets implemented, miners and users still have the option um, effectively not to, not to align with the consensus of that process um, and exercise the right to effectively fork or, or exit from the canonical Ethereum chain at any point. In parallel to all of this, there's a whole series of other kind of calls and initiatives that have sprung up. This slide comes from Hudson Jameson. So thank you, Hudson, for the wonderful uh, Doge iconography here. That's always important. Um, there's actually at least twice as many of these regular calls that are happening right now, uh, which is very, very exciting to see. Again, more, more inputs into, um, more, more voices being heard and more inputs into the process. Um, we make an effort to collect signals from the community. So there's this really awesome tool and initiative called Tenograph. You can check it out at, I believe it's tenograph.com, um, which collects stances of influencers over social media channels, such as Twitter into particular issues. We have a lot of forums. So this is what the Fellowship of Ethereum Magicians look like online. This is a discourse forum where the, the technical governance of Ethereum is discussed via a series of working groups, which you can see listed. And I showed this before. This is interesting just to show this contrast. This is what the magicians look like in person. There's another forum and initiative which has sprung up quite recently um, at ETHUB. I believe it's ethub.io. And this is explicitly community-driven non-technical governance, which is quite exciting. I'm very excited to see that this um, happens now and this exists now. So this is discussing all the other aspects of governance, um, the kind of philosophical, economic, ethical, et cetera, um, aspects of governance. Met a lot of overlap here with what we discussed at Koala. Um, they now have a regular call. The first call happened just a couple of days ago. Very, very exciting. Uh, finally, this is eThresearch, uh, E-T-H-R-E-S-E-A-R dot C-H. So this is a forum specifically focused on um, the more kind of scientific researchy type questions. So again, I think all of these kind of forums have a role to play in, in governance, uh, however informal. This was a survey put together by Eva Balin, recently quite intense survey, um, reaching out to the community and going quite deep and asking questions around things like legitimacy and um, you know, which, which group of stakeholders do you align with or identify with and, and you know, how do you feel that Ethereum governance is, is going. Um, the results of this have not yet been announced, I think, but um, just a very, very important initiative and I wanna highlight again, a lot of these important things are happening in a grassroots fashion. We, we clearly have these two particularly large organizations, one nonprofit, one for-profit, Ethereum Foundation and Consensus. And I guess kind of the, the role, the extent to which they exert influence or play a role in governance kind of depends upon how you think about governance. 
Um, it's important to highlight that neither of these has a formal official role in governance. However, because they um, employ a lot of the people and support a lot of the work um, being done on the core development of Ethereum, actually both at layer one and particularly in the case of consensus at layer two as well, um, and, and, and also control a lot of the resources, they do exert a lot of influence over Ethereum governance. Uh, and finally, you know, I think it's important to, to highlight and, and, and um, you know, just kind of be realistic about the fact that there are quite a few people and maybe organizations as well that are exerting influence and pulling strings from behind the scenes. Um, I've interacted with uh, a few of these people myself over the past couple of years, and uh, a lot of them choose to remain anonymous or pseudonymous and, and sort of contribute resources towards particular initiatives or want their voices to be heard. Uh, a lot of them are folks who were involved in or maybe influential in Ethereum very early on and uh, have chosen to kind of stay behind, um, stay out of the spotlight, so to speak. Um, but, uh, you know, this is also closely related to the concept of tyranny of structurelessness, which we'll discuss more in a moment. I think that's the last slide I have on Ethereum governance today. Do we have any questions or comments on that part? Very clarifying. Uh, it was really good. Thank you. Thanks for that. Link. Thanks, Santi. Appreciate that. All right. Let's keep moving. So I'm going to dive into, uh, okay, so actually, right, challenges and case studies. This is probably the most important part of this presentation. Um, I'm going to go through what I believe are kind of some of the biggest challenges that Ethereum governance is facing today. And um, so this was input into the Koala working group meetings last week because we, we used Ethereum governance as a case study. Um, and I'd like to present, it's funny, I think I was asked to present a list of challenges. I actually have two slides of them because there's quite a few big ones. Um, so we'll walk through most of these through a series of case studies. I think it's very important to present these challenges in context. So the first one, parity multi-sig funds recovery. So this happened in late 2017, early 2018. And um, there was a particular piece of software released by parity that was used, I believe it had something like 500 wallets in it, holding both Ether as well as other tokens um, held by a number of stakeholders, not just Parity. The, the single largest one was the Web3 Foundation, but there's a number of other projects that were holding funds in this wallet. And because of a bug in the way that software was implemented, there was actually a series of two incidents, and it culminated in early 2018 with effectively all of the funds stored in that wallet. At that point in time, it was well over 100 million US dollars worth of funds, um, those funds being frozen. So similar to what happened to the DAO hack in 2016, the difference in this case being that it wasn't that an attacker was able to kind of siphon off or drain those funds. They were just locked in place. And uh, a couple of the concerns that this highlighted are, first of all, concerns of legal liability on the part of core developers. Um, this is a gentleman named Yoichi Hirai, who up until this point, until 20, early 2018, was a very uh, prolific contributor to um, the Ethereum core protocol. And he made the decision that he, because he was facing severe uh, li legal liability concerns in his native country in Japan, despite the fact that he doesn't live in Japan, um, you know, he spoke to lawyers, got legal advice on this. He decided that he could no longer um, continue to contribute to, to the, the, the protocol. And in this particular case, he is actually an EIP editor. So if you'll recall from that earlier slide, right, there, he was one of the people responsible for reviewing EIPs and marking them as accepted or canonical. There was an EIP put forth, EIP 999, to execute a network hard fork to restore those funds. And he felt that even the act of reviewing that EIP, even the act of marking it as approved, could open him up to liability concerns. Um, so this has become a big topic. And, and, and he's no longer contributing. He, he's now working on another project at Layer 2. Um, so this is, this is a big concern on the part of core developers. This is a more recent one. Alexei Akunov uh, is another very well-known, well-respected uh, contributor. Uh, he's been spearheading this Ethereum 1x initiative. And he expressed his concern quite recently. This was, this was just a month ago, um, saying that, you know, politicians, quote unquote politicians, uh, in real world governance have this thing called parliamentary immunity and core developers in Ethereum do not. And as a result, he, he's again very concerned about uh, his own 
liability and, and uh, whether, you know, basically thinks the only way for core developers to protect themselves from it today is by hiding behind this, uh, this, this quote, veil of decentralization, a quite interesting topic. Uh, Ethereum 1X, as I mentioned, uh, I'm sorry, I may not have mentioned, this is an initiative to keep the existing Ethereum network healthy and upgrade it and maybe scale it a bit in parallel to the Ethereum 2 initiative. So this was a series of meetings held on the sidelines of DevCon. So this was October, November in Prague last year. And um, if you recognize any of the individuals in this, in this photo, you'll know that these are some pretty important, pretty influential people in the Ethereum community. The main point I want to make here is that, um, you know, we don't have good mechanisms for dealing with social governance in Ethereum. And in particular, a lot of the questions raised increasingly as part of Ethereum governance are less technical and more social. So in the context of Ethereum 1X, this is things like state rent, right? It turns out that we've been underpricing um, a particular resource, which is the ability to store data in the Ethereum blockchain indefinitely. And uh, if we are going to address those issues, you know, I'm worried that without some mechanism for discussing things that are not purely technical, um, that, that that's going to increasingly be a challenge in the Ethereum community. Um, this also touches upon the fact that kind of decisions happen, you know, in, in rooms full of people who, who know one another and are friends. Uh, and as a result, because we don't have more formalized governance mechanisms, I believe that uh, many stakeholders may be disenfranchised by that process. So ProgPow is one of the more contentious topics in Ethereum governance right now. It stands for Programmatic Proof of Work, and it's, in a nutshell, an effort to change the proof of work uh, mechanism in Ethereum to make it um, kind of more decentralized or more resistant to economies of scale um, on the part of certain miners and certain types of mining hardware. I think this raises very interesting questions about things like due process and uh, this, this thing that we've termed decision finality. So Evan is, is another uh, well-known, respected member of the community, and he made this very clear statement. He said, I actually liked ProgPow until I learned that the decision had already be ma been made to include it via the core devs process. Uh, and, and he felt that kind of in this particular case, you know, due process had not happened properly, and um, he and, and other stakeholders had, had not had a chance to participate in that process. Uh, and so actually, knowing when a decision is final and what that actually means when you only have this sort of rough consensus mechanism is quite challenging. Um, some of you may be familiar with Glenn Weil. He's um, an economist at Princeton who uh, you know, wrote a book called Radical Markets and, and has, has talked quite a bit about um, ideas and governance such as quadratic voting. Uh, Santi, I know that you guys have been working quite closely with Glenn at Democracy Earth to actually build tools around quadratic voting. That's very exciting. <laughs> Probably a topic of a separate conversation. Um, but I did want to include this quote from Glenn here because I really identify quite strongly with it, right? He says he's very skeptical of Ethereum and I guess just blockchains in general because while it formalizes property, it doesn't have any formal conception of a person, of an individual, especially a unique individual. And for that reason, it's fundamentally anti-democratic and plutocratic. Um, and, and that plays out uh, in various ways. Uh, yeah, so I have a couple of slides here on this. Um, so this is a something called a carbon vote, which happened quite recently, again, around ProgPow. And uh, the way this works is anyone who holds Ether can use that Ether to vote for or against a particular proposal. So in this case, these are people voting for and against ProgPow. Now, um, this highlights plutocracy because, of course, this is people voting using tokens. But it also highlights another interesting point, which is voter apathy. Uh, so around 3 million Ether participated in this vote, but that represents well under 3% of the overall uh, Ether in existence. So that's, I don't know, 2, two point something percent, 2.4 percent, 2.5 percent, something along those lines. Um, we've seen this in many other um, on-chain voting examples in, in, in the broader Ethereum community recently. There was a vote just a few days ago by Aragon um, in which... Again, the voter turnout was very, very low with single digits. And in particular, uh, I think a single whale, a single holder, a very large holder of their token, the ANT token, was able to sway the vote with a single vote. Uh, and in fact, even change the outcome of at least one of the proposals. Um, yeah, just wondering, I don't know if Santi or anyone else on this call have any thoughts on, on the issue of things like voter apathy or what you might do to address it. 
it's a, I'd it's like a, to actually know um, uh, the process. I mean, this kind of looks like a natural plutocracy, and regarding the process, do you hear me? Uh, is that is that Anya? I can hear you fine. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so, do you have any opinion on when the decision actually becomes final, or what should be changed so the decision becomes final? So, this is this question of, of decision finality that I mentioned, right? Yeah, but this is still questionable. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that without some more explicit governance mechanism, you know, it's like, how do I put it? Actually, in the positive case, it's quite easy. It's easy to say that a, that a decision becomes final when it's implemented in the protocol and people have upgraded. Because at that point, effectively, it's part of the protocol, it's canonical, we move on, right? What's, what's more interesting is that we don't have finality around a no, right? Because you can propose something and maybe it fails to achieve rough consensus, but it can be brought up again and again and again. And we see this happening with things like funds recovery, uh, that particular EIP 999, um, you know, it, it, it failed to achieve rough consensus in the community, but of course, the people who are impacted by it, um, you know, still lobby for it. And, and I, I guess that's, you know, maybe by design, it may be a good thing, or, or maybe not, depending on kind of how you, how you think governance should work. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Santi, I, I think you were, did I hear correctly? Were you adding something a moment ago? Yeah, I, I was just gonna mention an interesting thing that happened in the in the Aragon vote was uh, a strategy played by a single voter that simply waited for everyone to see how uh, everyone voted on the different issues, and that single voter uh, simply allocated tokens strategically to decide the outcome of this uh, of, of three critical issues in in the election. So coin coin voting really. Uh, what happens with it is that usually less than less than one percent of the individual participants actually can have a tremendous influence over the, the decision making process. Exactly. So um, without identity or without some way of having a more egalitarian way of making the decision legitimate, we do democracy, which is not just about making the best decision, but also uh, legitimacy really matters, and legitimacy matters when the risk is very high. The higher the risk, the more important uh, to, to grasp the legitimacy in a decision-making process. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it is really interesting to learn from each one of these implementations and, and learn from the strategies that are being played out. Cool, thanks for sharing. Yeah, legitimacy is a, a, a big question. Uh, I, I think I actually have a, a slide on that later, so I think we'll talk about that a bit more. Um, Let's cool. Let's keep moving here. So, um, we core developers, of course, care a great deal about what the community thinks. Uh, and so, you hear this term, the community, constantly. The problem is that, again, with lack of explicit identity, the you know we can do things like coin votes, but you know we also end up doing things like Twitter polls because we want to hear not just the voice of the plutocrats and, and avoid some of the issues that, for example, Santi mentioned a moment ago. Um, and Twitter polls are, of course, suboptimal for a whole host of reasons, right? They, they can be gamed or manipulated or, or attacked or brigaded. Uh, so here's an example of a coin vote that was done, sorry, of a, of a Twitter poll that was done um, on the topic of ProgPal recently. Uh, so ProgPal also highlights interesting questions about things like economics. Um, I believe this graph comes from Eric Connor. Again, I'm sorry if I've misattributed any of these things. The attributions, the proper attributions are in the notes of the slides. Uh, this shows um, in red the issuance rate of Ether and in blue the total supply. Uh, this is quite a helpful graph. This shows, for example, the, the most recent Constantinople upgrade when we reduced issuance. The point I want to make is that we don't actually have any economists, any real economists, you know, among the core developers or, or that have any formal say uh, in Ethereum governance. And so I think as we face more and more complex questions around things, including economics, um, you know, that's something that, that we want to talk about, uh, whether we need some sort of economic council, for example. Cool. The next case study is the Constantinople postponement. So this raises a very interesting question around um, the pace of innovation and things like invariance. So if you'll recall, 
there, the upgrade was supposed to happen in mid-January. And at the very last minute, I think it was something between 36 and 48 hours prior to when the upgrade was supposed to kick in. So it had already been announced. Everyone had already upgraded their software. We were kind of just waiting for that block number to arrive. It was discovered, not that there was a bug in the implementation, but that certain classes of smart contracts, certain classes of applications may have been assuming that something which was about to change was actually an invariant. And in this particular case, it had to do with reducing the gas pricing of a certain operation, which we kind of naively thought was a safe thing to do. And so this raises, as I was saying, questions about like, what is the social contract we have with developers? Um, what sort of things are they assuming will be invariant? And um, that has already made it very difficult to make any changes to Ethereum. Um, because if you have people assuming things as basic as gas prices are never going to change, then, then you know, it, it makes it very difficult to kind of, quote unquote, move fast and break things or like continue to innovate. This is a thread from the Fellowship of Ethereum Magicians Forum on this topic, if you're interested in reading more about it. Uh, so we, uh, myself and, and several others, launched an initiative quite recently to discuss the possibility of using block rewards to fund something like a developer or ecosystem fund. Uh, so the way that block rewards work right now is they're used exclusively to pay miners for network security, basically. And so we raised this question, could a portion of those block rewards be used to fund effectively the public good? Uh, other blockchains such as Zcash um, do this and have for quite some time. Uh, so the first kind of challenge this highlights is this question of, of openness versus closed doors. Um, so, so this is a public GitHub repository where we got some quite interesting um, and exciting conversation going around how this might work and, and sort of, you know, answering, attempting to answer some of the governance questions that it raises. Um, we want to kind of do this in as open a possible as, sorry, as open a fashion as possible, but it's very, very challenging because um, I guess I feel like core developers, or in this particular case, this was not even core developers uh, exclusively, just all the people participating in this initiative, um, you know, if, if we make these decisions or have these conversations in private, then we get attacked for acting like a cabal and, um, you know, effectively not being open and participatory in, in, in the kind of conversation or discussion or decision making process. But on the flip side, if we try to have these conversations in public, then as was the case here with this, this particular initiative, we get quite fiercely attacked in, in I, I really want to emphasize how how brutal this was, this particular case, right? We have, a, a, I mean, it may be a small number of people, but, but very, very vocal community members who, um, who react quite negatively and quite strongly to any proposal that they perceive as being half-baked or illegitimate or, or not well thought through. Um, and so this is a very core tension and, and a big challenge that I think um, many of the, um, I don't know, decision makers or influencers in the Ethereum community are facing. Uh, so here's, here's a particular example here. We had a discussion group, uh, a Telegram group, where a lot of good ideas were being shared. And um, anyway, I don't want to go into the details of this particular case, but uh, it, it was messy and it was quite frustrating. Um, you know, closely related to this is just the question of, of transparency and accountability on the part of organizations like the Ethereum Foundation that have historically operated with very, very, very little uh, of either of these. Um, so this, this gentleman, Eric Connor, uh, made a proposal, I believe this is on the ETH Hub community forum, um, I think it's community.ethub.io, uh, suggesting what minimum viable Ethereum Foundation transparency would look like. So again, just on this topic of transparency, I think transparency is important for legitimacy, which um, as Santi mentioned a moment ago, very, very important in our governance. So another case study is um, another core developer, a gentleman named Afri Shudden, who made a very provocative tweet recently, a, a few months ago, um, I think I have an image of it here. Um, and and if, you, if you know Afri at all, you'll know that, you know, this was meant in good faith and it was meant to kind of stir up conversation. But unfortunately, uh, you know, he also came under attack. There really is no other word for it um, by many members of the community on channels, including Twitter and Reddit. Um, and in fact, faced things as severe as threats of violence against um, himself and his family. And I think that, you know, we can all agree that, that sort of behavior is inappropriate, but that in online forums, you know, where you are anonymous or pseudonymous, um, unfortunately, these sorts of things happen. 
And um, it got so severe that Afri decided to stop contributing to Ethereum entirely. So this is a second case. I showed the case of a gentleman in Yoichi earlier, right? You know, we have very, very, very limited um, numbers of people contributing, especially at the core layer to Ethereum. And so this, this is Hudson, another respected member of the community, kind of responding to what happened to Afri. You can see here that, that his tweet was deleted. In fact, he chose to delete his entire um, Twitter in response to this. Um, it's very, very frustrating. And, and I think that um, this may fall under the purview of governance. You know, do we need things like codes of conduct, for example? Are those desirable or even possible? Uh, and, and finally, in, in closing this section, just a couple of uh, miscellaneous but important topics to highlight. So, you know, this, so, so first of all, this image is of a group of core developers having a, a very ad hoc meeting. I, I love this because we're sitting on the floor here, so it's pretty much as ad hoc as you can get on the sidelines of the DevCon conference in Prague in, um, in the autumn of last year, uh, discussing, um, I guess, just kind of things like the Ethereum 1X initiative. And, you know, when I learned recently about this concept of the tyranny of structurelessness, uh, when I read that initial essay by Joe Freeman, which was published in the 70s, it literally sent shivers down my spine because I identified so strongly with aspects of it. Um, I'll leave it to anyone who's unfamiliar with this topic to kind of watch, or, or sorry, to, to read that essay on their own. Um, but what it sort of says is that in the absence of any of these more explicit decision-making structures, there is no such thing as, as a lack of structure. And so what happens is people kind of naturally um, form these uh, kind of organic structures by which they communicate with one another and, and, and decisions get made. And uh, this happens, you know, very, very much in the Ethereum community today. So we have groups of people who happen to, you know, more or less look alike and sound alike, who happen to know each other and trust each other from their daily work, who, um, you know, it, this is a very natural process. I'm not suggesting there's anything wrong with a group of core developers sitting down and discussing the protocol. Um, but when it gets to a point where things like resources are being allocated or decisions are being made, it naturally raises this question, you know, who does and does not have a voice in this process and, and can we be more explicit and, and enfranchise a greater um, set of community participants and stakeholders in Ethereum and, and what would a response to tyranny of structurelessness look like? I think this is probably the single biggest challenge that we face in Ethereum governance today. Um, so, so Vlad, many of you may be familiar with him, right? He's, he's a researcher who has um, done quite a bit of thinking and, and writing as well on the topic of governance. Um, you know, asked this very interesting and somewhat provocative question recently on Twitter. And uh, if you read through the responses to this, they're quite interesting, but I, I want to highlight that I don't think anyone had any very good answers to this question. Uh, so I think it is a question that we struggle with. And, and Santi, this goes directly back to the question you raised earlier in the context of things like voter apathy. Um, like, what is our source of legitimacy in a community like Ethereum where we don't have a constitution and we don't have a, you know, a monarch or... Uh, you know, do we even have something like a social contract? It's a bit, it's a bit unclear, but it's a very interesting question to ask. Um, Vlad has also asked provocative questions like this one. Um, and, and I think um, one of the great things I began to learn from the other Koala participants is that there's, you know, a thousand years or I guess multiple thousands of years of, of thought that have gone into answering questions such as this, uh, if we are unafraid of um, engaging with legal scholars and, and philosophers and um, opening textbooks and things like that. So we should do more of that. Um, cool. Any final thoughts on challenges and case studies before we move on? Yeah, I think that the question on legitimacy is getting, being getting raised over and over again. Uh, but if there are any thoughts on what might be the sources of this legitimacy. So, I mean, looking through standard definitions in political philosophy, is it consent of participants or maybe the desirable outcomes or maybe fairness of the process or things like that? I think those are excellent questions and suggestions. Um, yeah, I, Personally, it's a, good, it's a good question. I mean, I think that we probably want some hybrid of those things. And I think, I think I, I, okay, I guess there's two ways to look at it. The first is kind of like, what are things like today? And then what could or should things be like in the future? Today, 
I think it's some combination of maybe people feel, the community feels that those people who are making the decisions are competent, right? They've sort of managed to build Ethereum and it works more or less. Um, and, and the decisions that are you know, being made and the changes that are being made to the protocol are good decisions by and large, or at least historically they have been. Um, I think that's certainly part of it. I think a lot of the stakeholders, the users in Ethereum today are people who are also building and contributing to it themselves. So they may feel that they do have a voice in that process. Sorry, I'm just trying to pull up the chat window here. I think someone posted a comment. I don't know why I can't see the, oh, here we go, the chat window. I think I can't see it while I'm sharing my screen. So Lane, I can, I can maybe jump in and Please. Um, say, so it was a, a comment from Anya, and, and sorry, Anya, I hope I'm not jumping, jumping over you here. Um, so it was, just, it was a definition of legitimacy, um, uh, which really depended on four specific properties. So determinacy, like a readily ascertainable content of a rule, Symbolic validation, meaning somebody in charge says, yes, this is the rule. Coherence, meaning that um, a, a rule is consistently or generally applied. And adherence, meaning uh, that it is sort of, it, it connects to other rules in the system and, and makes sense sort of in the big picture. But, but it does make me want to ask a question of you, Lane. So, I mean, I guess I sort of think um, I've found it hard over the years to describe what legitimacy is in a really broad term as it applies to all kinds of different organizations. I think there are perceptions of legitimacy and I think they're really important. So like what the people in the ecosystem actually um, would care about or would, would recognize as being important values is really to me what legitimacy comes down to. And so I was sure. thinking maybe this would be a chance to just talk about a little bit about you know how that might work within the Ethereum ecosystem. What kinds of values um, get recognized as being le you know legitimate in, for for making decisions? If that makes sense. Thanks for for sharing that. Um, sorry, I'm I'm struggling here a little bit because I just realized that the, the unfortunately the slides are not being shown, and that's quite. Frustrating. I, hopefully, the Zoom recording. I have a couple of backups here. We'll, we'll capture that. Um, I think only our aud audio is being broadcast. Um, okay, that's fine. Let's keep moving. Um, sorry, Christy. So I think. Sorry, you were asking. I, would you mind restating the question? Yeah. I mean, I guess I just maybe I just wanted to narrow down what we're talking about when we talk about legitimacy, and and I was hoping you could. Um, talk about like the kinds of values that people within the Ethereum ecosystem care about. So thinking about things like right. Sabo's law or thinking about the value of decentralization or whatever, like some of the things that would make, you know, decisions look legitimate to the people within the ecosystem. Would you start a question? Yeah, that's an excellent question. You know, I, I, I guess I, the main thing I want to say in response to that is that we struggle a lot with this. And this goes back to that first set of kind of pictures I showed, which was Ethereum social evolution. You know, I, I suspect early on when Ethereum was a very small group of people who knew each other and, you know, there's certainly a high degree of homophily in those situations. So they're people who tend to share values as well. It's fairly easy to kind of know even, even implicitly, even without stating explicitly what your kind of values are. Um, but the challenge that I feel as a stakeholder or, or you know, um, uh, I don't know what the right word for this is. Like, I'll just say as a core developer in Ethereum, right, I really struggle to know what those values are that unite us today. And in particular, in the context of kind of questions like legitimacy, right, what, how would these decisions have to be made and what sort of decisions would have to be made for them to be viewed as legitimate, you know, on the part of the broader community. Um, and this, again, all the questions we've talked about, right, we don't, we don't have strong signaling tools, you know, we, we have this very ill-defined term, the community, which, which we, don't, we don't know exactly kind of which, you know, groups of stakeholders that includes, et cetera. I, I feel pretty strongly that I know what like a lot of my fellow core developers feel. Um, and, and, and that's largely what we spoke about at the workshop. So 
you know, we care a great deal about decentralization. We care a great deal about um, decisions being made that are strongly technically competent. Um, we care a great deal about perceived fairness, but I really struggle to know what the broader community feels. If I can dive in, I think quite recently in the event of Binance hack, there was a discussion on Twitter again about core values uh, on Ethereum and other blockchains, uh, which also raised this exact point, whether immutability, and I mean the suggestion after the Binance hack was to reorg Bitcoin, which was of course not feasible, but I mean it hit a lot of, started a lot of heated discussions, including people from Ethereum community. So would, would you say that immutability is, might be one of the core values? Yeah, this is an interesting question as well. Immutability comes up again and again. Um, I'm not a huge fan of that particular term because I think it's a little bit of an overloaded term and it's a bit ill-defined. Like I wouldn't call immutability a value. I think, I think immutability, like I think there are underlying values at question there, like fairness and transparency. Like just, just as one example, if it were the case that um, changes could be made to the ledger, what we call an irregular state transition, right? So that's exactly what happened in the case of the Ethereum, Ethereum Classic fork after the DAO hack in 2016. Um, like it, it, that itself raises questions about things like due process and transparency, et cetera. And so immutability is kind of, I don't know, one way of thinking about it is a bit of a safety mechanism, right? Because if you don't have due process or transparency or legitimate decision-making, et cetera, then at least you can rely on you know, that history being intact. Does that sort of make sense? Yeah, totally. But to turn that around, maybe if we do have a legitimate decision-making process with due, due process, et cetera, then maybe it, maybe it would be viewed as legitimate if kind of changes were made and we were to kind of um, violate immutability in certain cases. I also want to highlight that like, it's a bit of a red herring to me personally because we're constantly upgrading the protocol. And each of those changes, um, you know, mutates, maybe not historical state, but it kind of changes the protocol itself. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, cool, let's move through this next section um, and then get to the interesting stuff. So I'm not gonna spend much time on this, but, but one of the things that I was asked to do as part of this presentation was to tie Ethereum governance, and in particular, the sort of challenges um, and case studies that we talked about to kind of real world fields, and in particular, some of the working groups um, that were present in the Koala meeting. Uh, so again, I'll share the slide deck later. These are <laughs> incredibly dense, and, and we could spend quite a bit of time on each of these. But I just want to point out that like, when you open Pandora's box of existing, you know, prior work, academic work, literature, etc, on topics um, such as these legal political theory, etc, there's fascinating questions that get raised about very basic things um, like sources of authority and legitimacy, which we're talking about, uh, social norms, you know, property rights, things like a fork. Is a fork you know, considered legal? Like to Vlad's earlier question, is it a revolution? What does that mean exactly? Um, fascinating questions about identity and sovereignty. We talked a little bit about um, uh, this in the context of Glenn Weil's comments about um, lack of formalized identity. Another topic uh, that we discussed was dispute resolution. Fascinating. The one I want to highlight here is um, the last bullet point here, like mercy, right? In, in, in real world decision making, we have, you know, judges can, and, and uh, um, anyone kind of, um, you know, ruling on disputes can use, can fall back on like values or human traits or things such as mercy and judgment. Like how or to what extent can those things be represented in code? I think it's a really interesting question that uh, we're gonna face not just in the context of Ethereum and not just in the context of blockchain, but in the context of AI and kind of all autonomous systems, which is why, again, I think that this engagement between practitioners and um, um, theorists and thinkers is so important at this stage. Um, representation liability, more questions here. Legal philosophy and theory. Uh, I didn't know what legal philosophy was until last week and I learned a great deal, so I urge those who are not familiar with the topic to, to dig into it and learn 
uh, about it. It's very relevant. Political philosophy as well, social theory, uh, international law. So something that we spoke a lot about is kind of what is a DAO and how do we make DAOs legible to both regulators and just kind of existing legal, real world legal systems. Um, this one I want to highlight a little bit more. So um, some, some folks, I'm sure most of the people here in this call are familiar with Eleanor Ostrom and her work. Um, you know, many of the people in the Ethereum community may not be, but um, something worth, worth looking into. So um, she did a great deal of work on uh, the concept of commons-based governance, so governing things like the commons and overcoming challenges like the tragedy of the commons. And so she lays out, she, she's especially well known for this particular, um, this particular framework where she lays out these eight suggestions for responsibly governing commons and overcoming the tragedy of the commons. And as we were talking about this and discussing Ethereum in the context of this work, um, I, I think it's a very interesting lens through which to kind of view Ethereum and, and view blockchains in general. Like, are they commons? Should they be governed like commons? Um, and I won't go through each of these either, but if we do think of Ethereum or similar blockchains as a commons, and if we do believe that Ostrom's recommendations here hold value, then we have a lot of work to do. Because as you can see, we sort of have failed to check most of these boxes. Um, and I think that this may be, again, an interesting lens through which to view some of the challenges we're facing in Ethereum governance today. All right, so we're now in the most interesting part where we're talking a bit about some um, ideas and recommendations going forward. So let's kind of dive into that and then conclude with the, uh, the findings, uh, sneak peek of the findings with the working group. So this first set of um, ideas come directly from me and then we'll move into the group's findings. So I'll kind of move quickly through these. Uh, I think that Step one is always kind of being honest about the way things are today. And so recognizing what is and is not working well today. Uh, in particular that we do, you know, our governance today does exhibit elements of things like technocracy and plutocracy and they, they may not be desirable. Um, I think a really good place to start is by articulating things like our values and our goals, figuring out what we stand for uh, as a community. Um, this is very challenging in a community like the Ethereum community, which is, um, which is very diverse. And it's very hard to kind of draw lines around it. Um, but so interesting to ask questions like, you know, would there be value in having something like a charter or a constitution or for, for segments of the community to kind of, um, you know, kind of align themselves around things like values. Um, making governance power structures be more explicit to battle the tyranny of structurelessness, which we talked about before. I really like the sort of local autonomous kind of permissionless organizing on the part of different groups of stakeholders that's happened. Uh, we spoke about, for example, the, the Fellowship of Ethereum Magicians. I think that's the best example of this to date. There's been quite a few recently. Another one is called the Cat Herders, which is uh, a sort of tongue in cheek name, but it refers to a group that is focused more on things like project management um, that again has just arisen as a DAO. It's sort of a canonical DAO. It's just a loose affiliation of individuals around the world um, who uh, you know, are, are, are contributing to Ethereum and, and their voices being heard. Uh, I think this is quite interesting, right? I think that the point to highlight here is that neither purely centralized nor decentralized governance mechanisms, I think, are sufficient in their own right. And so I think a very, very interesting idea to explore here is how we can have both elements and kind of take advantage of the, the, the better parts of each of these, right? So sort of centralized things. So the Ethereum Foundation is a good example of this that exist in the real world, have a foot on the ground, so to speak, um, that can be held accountable to decentralized uh, on-chain things like DAOs. And um, so how DAOs can hold them accountable, but then how the, the centralized pieces can support the things like the DAOs by doing things like uh, uh, you know, managing or raising funds. Uh, I think it's important to recognize that decentralization is a journey <laughs> and needs to maybe be done incrementally. Um, and so a very interesting example of this in Ethereum is like a conversation around how one might decentralize something like the Ethereum Foundation, for example, um, turn it into more of a DAO over time, um, and just celebrating kind of early wins around decentralization. So, um, you know, some of the things like the Fellowship of Ethereum Magicians that have um, already uh, found some degree of success. I think we have a lot to learn from experts um, and prior art. So folks such as um, 
the Koala participants. I think that we should not hesitate to take good ideas from all projects, including bad projects. I think that there are examples of, of other blockchain projects in particular that um, the Ethereum community sometimes tends to write off as, for example, not completely decentralized. Um, but I think that there are interesting experiments being run in things like governance and uh, by other projects, and we should look to them and learn from them. Um, you know, I think collecting signals and running experiments is not especially controversial. I think move fast and break things is probably very controversial in the Ethereum community. So I guess the question I want to ask here is, um, you know, how do we do that? How do we continue to innovate as a community and as a platform without breaking too many things? So can we run experiments on side chains? Can we run experiments on new chains? Uh, you know, we certainly have a really exciting opportunity with Ethereum 2 in particular to reboot and, and, and do some new things that uh, would not be possible in the existing Ethereum network. Um, this is such a big topic and I could spend, I think we could all spend hours discussing and debating this particular topic. Um, I, I really just want to touch upon it here very briefly. I think, uh, again, this goes back to that early set of slides and images I showed. Um, you know, I personally perceive Ethereum to be a platform for all humans everywhere. Uh, we're certainly a long way from that today, but to the extent we feel that uh, it is a general purpose platform um, that, you know, has potential to host a lot of things like commerce or, or finance, uh, you know, institutions and, and, and even bigger things like what Santi and his team are building, um, you know, things like democracy and voting, et cetera, identity systems. I think it's really crucial that we have as broad a set of, um, you know, inputs and just hear as, as, as broad an, an array of voices in the governance process today as possible. And I think that um, things like the tyranny of structural assist make this very difficult because as you saw in some of the images I showed, you know, it tends to be a small group of people who, again, kind of look alike and sound alike and, and know and trust one another. Um, and I do think the governance has a role to play in increasing diversity. Um, I'll pause here and see if anyone else wants to add anything on this important topic before I move on. All right. Again, big important topic. We should devote a, a future conversation to this alone. Um, I want to spend just a quick moment appreciating the important work that's being done on DAOs right now. So, um, you know, I think everyone is aware that the original DAO, the one created by the Slocket team, was launched um, almost exactly three years ago in 2016. And, you know, because of what happened, DAO has been kind of a a bad word in the Ethereum community until very, very recently, I think as recently as just a couple of months ago. Um, but we've seen this explosion of DAOs uh, very recently, new initiatives. So some folks have called 2019 the year of the DAO. Um, I have a few particular ones highlighted here. So DX DAO, which is being launched in collaboration between uh, Gnosis and DAO Stack. Um, Moloch DAO, as well as a, a new initiative um, by a team called MetaCartel, which is forking Moloch DAO, uh, launching another DAO to focus more on kind of layer two application uh, usability type initiatives. Um, Aragon uh, has also uh, announced that they're working on things like a, a DAO to fund ecosystem support, uh, ecosystem projects, infrastructure, et cetera. So the point I wanna make here is that DAOs are not just about allocating resources, but they are actually little experiments in governance because each of these DAOs needs to figure out how to um, collect resources and govern those resources. Um, and so this makes me quite hopeful for the future of Ethereum governance. I think a very important work is being done here. Uh, the, the most important thing to highlight, though, is all of this is happening at layer two. None of these DAOs are yet in any way, shape, or form intended to kind of govern something like the layer one protocol itself. It'll be very exciting to watch how this plays out. All right, finally, um, some of the findings from the working group. So let me just start by very briefly introducing uh, what this was about. So Koala, as I mentioned before, is an organization that's been around for, for a few years, and it seeks to bring together scholars with practitioners, so people like protocol architects and core developers um, who are actually building things like blockchains, and, and they've held a number of um, forums and symposia around the world. Uh, right now, they're focused on these smaller working groups, like this one that we just had, on uh, blockchain governance using Ethereum governance as a case study. Uh, this is a list of the Koala working groups from the Koala website. I believe it's coala.global. 
Um, and so again, this particular working group was focused on blockchain governance, but there's other um, summits planned in the future to talk about other topics such as co-ops. This is a snapshot of our working group um, focused on governance held inside a really lovely old chapel in Italy. And um, yeah, so an important disclaimer. So this is just a very quick sneak peek of some of the work that was done. The group will be releasing a, a much more detailed report later. And I think a lot of the ideas that were discussed require, uh, require some context. The findings are very much a work in progress. Um, I wanna emphasize that this is just a set of ideas shared by a group of individuals. This is not sort of an official koala report. Um, you know, these are things that are based on best practice in other fields and we don't sort of know for sure whether or to what extent or how well they work on Ethereum, et cetera. Um, let me just check who's on our call right now. So we're very fortunate to have Christy on the call as well. And Christy, if you want to jump in to any of this, please feel free. <laughs> okay, sure. Thanks, Lane. I, I don't have anything to say in particular about this slide, about the stakeholder mapping. I think, um, I don't know if Phoebe is still on or not, who created this lovely I am uh, there. <laughs> slide. Okay. Yeah, Phoebe, do you, are you, in a place where you can chat for a moment, do you want to quickly kind yeah. of introduce any of this, please? Sure, although I don't, definitely don't want to take ownership for this beautiful diagram, because this was actually uh, drawn out on a whiteboard by, mainly by Kia and, well, it was a group effort, so I digitized it. Um, sorry for the building works in the background, by the way, there's a bit of drilling. <laughs> Um, so what we've got here is basically on the x-axis or yeah across we listed the stakeholders or yeah we kind of brainstormed with the help of Lane all of the Ethereum stakeholders we've got Ethereum Foundation consensus and you can read across if anything's unclear um, please just jump in and ask uh, and then on the y-axis going down we listed what is governed so we've got protocol network human resources the foundation resources, clients, and apps. Um, and then essentially, we coded this uh, with colors. So red is kind of the actual situation and blue is desired or kind of ideal situation um, in kind of utopian how we want it to be. And then it's the number of ticks kind of indicate the extent of the, like how, how strong that um, governing is. So does that make sense? Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you, Phoebe. Um, the, the one thing I want to add here is that at a glance already, you can begin to see some of the kind of power dynamics in Ethereum, which I think is what's so interesting about an exercise like this. So in particular, you can see um, that, that organizations like EF and Consensus will have a great deal of um, uh, governing power, let's say today, Whereas organizations like the Ethereum magicians, it's much more aspirational. I think we all kind of feel mm -hmm. that we want the magicians to have a greater role, but um, it's, it's rather limited today. And so it'd be interesting to discuss um, how that can uh, be improved by, a, you know, by a governance. And it's also interesting that, I mean, this, that model is assuming that everybody believes that it would be good to have more weigh in by the magicians. You know, that could just be representative of the small group. Who is there. Yeah, that's a good point to make. Yeah, we, we should, it would be great to include more, um, more community voices in, in a, a further or a, a, another attempt at the, the stakeholder mapping process. I think, um, I mean, this is uh, such a great uh, uh, map, uh, Phoebe and Lane. I think it's really um, helpful in so many ways. And when, during the actual conversations last week, we spent a lot of time talking about like what the Z axis would be because there were like several different potential candidates for Zia, as if we were going to do a 3D picture. Um, but, I, but when I see this, I mean, maybe it's my legal training, but, but one of the things that is kind of all like embedded across this map that isn't really visible anywhere is the question of liability, right? So there's a lot, there's stuff about resource allocation, which is super important and really looks at sort of, you know, who has control over human resources, but there's no, you know, but, but the part that, that we couldn't figure out how to put on this map and um, and that is sort of an overhang is, are some of the questions that Lane alluded to in the, in the earlier slides uh, around 
question of who's got the responsibilities for making choices that can sometimes seem to be, you know, quite political. And how do, for example, people like core devs get protected from liability that may arise from making some of those choices? That's an awesome point. Thanks for raising that point. Yeah, I think any attempt to take something as complex and dynamic as governance of something like Ethereum and reduce it down to you know, only two dimensions or even three dimensions is sort of necessarily reductionist in some way. And there's so many other interesting dimensions we could explore here. Um, thanks for making that point. This is, I found this exercise quite valuable and I, I hope others do as well. And I'd love to, um, yeah, just continue more of these types of mapping activities in the future and, and try to look at some of those other dimensions. Just a comment, that this is a very good map, but I think the last column, the community one, there is a lot there and, and maybe that, that particular column could be segmented a little bit more eventually. Thanks, William. That's very true. So, so I, don't, I don't know if you can see it on this previous slide. I guess you can't, yeah. We, we literally ran out of space on the whiteboard and we kind of realized that there's like two or three or four or five other groups of stakeholders that we'd like to factor in. Um, there's just many of them. So it would be great to kind of expand this horizontally more. And, and I'm sure there's others we're still missing here. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to move a bit more. So another thing we did was try to map um, things like the formal governance process. So this should look a little bit similar to some of those images I showed early on. Um, this was an attempt to be a little bit more explicit about how um, governance of the protocol works. And I added, for example, my best estimates of like the percentage of EIPs that make it through each of these stages. Also, this, this arrow that's highlighted in red here makes explicit something I said earlier when I first showed um, some other flowcharts, which is that uh, the core developers actually have um, the ability to include any EIP, um, even one that hasn't sort of flown through that, uh, sorry, flowed through that official approval process. So I think uh, it worked like this is also very helpful just for myself clarifying the way governance works today. Uh, we talked as part of the stakeholder mapping process about things like pain points on the part of different groups of stakeholders. So core devs is the most germane one for, for myself, um, but it would be good to kind of look at some of those pain points from the perspective of other community members. Um, so again, we won't go through all of these, but uh, lack of decision finality, we talked about that. I think that can be quite frustrating to core developers that the idea that certain topics get brought up again and again and again and consume quite a bit of bandwidth on our limited um, governance channels like the core devs calls, um, general feeling that sometimes there's a lack of direction or kind of technical leadership with certain initiatives, um, such as some of the Ethereum 1x stuff that's happening. Uh, I think we talked a little bit about core devs feeling a bit under attack by the community, sort of whether we're working publicly or privately, so kind of can't win for losing type situation there. Um, something we spent quite a bit of time talking about is that core developers really want to be left alone to write code uh, and are usually not very excited to do things such as manage people or draw up budgets and yet they have a very significant role to play in governance and are um, a, a bottleneck to some of these things and so we're just wondering kind of what could be done or what could be put in place to make their lives easier along these lines um, and anything any of the other folks want to add or ask on these points before i move on Lane, I'm not sure if this is the purpose of this call or not, but do, do you intend to um, provide some guidance in terms of how some of these pain points uh, could be uh, taken care of or could be uh, improved? Um, I'm not sure if this is what you intend to do here or not. Yeah, that's a great question, William. So um, I, I think in, in the slides after this, there's we will touch upon very briefly a couple of the group's recommendations, but um, I, I'm calling it a sneak peek, but there is a much longer set of recommendations that we tentatively came up with, and those need to be presented in the context of a report. So our goal is to, um, is to do that shortly in the, in the form of a report. But, but we, did, we did think quite a bit about all of these, and we do have suggestions um, for many of them. So this is something we spent quite a bit of time actually before meeting in person discussing and getting on the same page about just why we feel that um, 
more explicit governance is useful in the first place. Um, so Christy, something that I believe you mentioned that, that struck me and really stuck with me from our meetings last week, I, I believe it was regarding the use of the word enlightened, right? And so I had mentioned that to me, Ethereum represents, um, you know, it, it's not that Ethereum is kind of above or beyond or outside of politics. It's that like it represents a chance at a more enlightened form of politics, uh, which was how I kind of phrased it. And, and, and from my perspective, that means building better human institutions, things that are more open, participatory, just, fair, transparent, et cetera. And, uh, and Christy, you responded by saying, if I remember correctly, that what the enlightenment was, you know, was specifically a process, a political process that, that you know, played out over many years. Um, I guess it was in, in Europe throughout the, uh, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm showing my, my terrible history here, right? But kind of like uh, the 18th century and, and, and through things like the French Revolution, which was explicitly about limiting the ability of um, small groups of people to exercise power arbitrarily. Am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, wow, yeah. Um, you know, so here we are, and I'm hoping there aren't any, you know, really sort of heavy duty legal uh, and political philosophers on the call because, because what I can say is, you know, is uh, probably, subject to some uh, sort of clarification by people who know more. But yes, I mean, that's much I can say with certainty. And that is the Enlightenment was in the 18th century. It was, and it really was the emergence of a series of values which were focused on the idea that individuals have rights, that, it, you know, all human beings are created equal. The ideas that you see in the Declaration of Independence in the United States really comes out of this idea um, and uh, generated things like the idea of one person, one vote. Um, if you look at the French Revolution and the, the um, you know, the slogan was liberty, equality, and fraternity. And this idea of individual freedom, of the equality of people, and of fraternity meaning sort of uh, the chance to form uh, collective communities in ways that the person chooses, which, you know, can give them a sense of meaning and place in the world. And um, and, and when you look at the sort of the broad sweep of human history, and, and the Enlightenment is a response to uh, arbitrary power, to inherited monarchies, to sort of non-transparent um, and potentially, you know, by, you know, well, non-legitimate um, exercises of power. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think legitimate is the right word there. It's really sort of um, um, non-democratic exercises of power. Um, and tribalism. And so uh, when I think about enlightened and enlightenment values, I really do think about those sort of classical liberal values um, around uh, individual dignity and individual liberty um, and individual equality so that everybody who has a stake in a community is treated with equal dignity and respect um, and has an equal say. And that's really what the enlightenment fundamentally was about the sort of broad individual political freedom. Um, and so, yes, I mean, I guess uh, wherever um, somebody sees tribalism or small groups of people making decisions that affect a lot of uh, other community members, um, you could say that that's not actually how, you know, and, um, how the Enlightenment values would say that system should operate. Is that helpful? That was incredibly helpful. Thank you. You, you said this uh, far better than I could have. Um, but uh, I, I just, I mean, again, I just want to say that, that that particular thought that you expressed like really, really, really stuck with me. I think it was probably my biggest takeaway, uh, my single biggest takeaway from the Koala workshop. And that was specifically that while I and I think many others naively think of Ethereum as, um, as a sort of, you know, a, a platform for enlightened governance, um, I mean, it, it has potential to be. There's no question about that, but we're not there yet. And just as you said a moment ago, to the extent that the decisions are being made by a small number of people via, you know, kind of processes that are anything but transparent and inclusive and participatory uh, and, and, and things like tribalism are, are rife, we're very far from enlightened today. So we have a lot of work to do. Um, so, so this is something that we talked about, which I think is quite interesting. Um, and it was kind of like, what role do DAOs have to play in Ethereum governance? And are they not something that we could use 
to begin to put in place um, some, oh boy, I'm, I'm choosing my words very carefully here. <laughs> some sort of structures, right, that, that would allow us to, to make governance slightly more explicit. And I, I wanna emphasize that um, by putting up an image like this, I'm not suggesting that we kind of want on-chain governance in Ethereum. It's not something that I think the community wants. It's not something that I'm personally uh, excited about, but maybe even as a signaling tool, right? Would it be interesting to see different groups of stakeholders, such as the ones I have here, miners or DAP developers or investors or Ethereum magicians, et cetera, align into affinity groups represented by DAOs and possibly have some sort of a scenario where some resources can flow down into those groups and voice or signals can flow up. Uh, and so sort of having DAOs talk to DAOs. This is kind of the, the prototypical, one prototypical model of Ethereum governance that emerged through the block rewards funding proposal uh, discussions, the EIP 1890 discussions um, that I think have some potential. Um, I don't know if anyone on the call has any thoughts about what this could look like. But I guess the, the last thing I'll say here is that to some extent this is already happening informally, right? So it's very much the case that we do have these groups such as the Ethereum magicians um, that, that are beginning to kind of self-organize. And I think that's great. We really like to see this kind of grassroots organizing happening. And so what would that look like if it was made slightly more explicit via the use of, of DAOs, for example? And do we need kind of protocols to allow DAOs to, to talk to other DAOs or exchange value or voice? Um, here's another look, and this um, suggests the introduction of a really exciting idea called a clearinghouse, which Christy shared with us. And I'd love to uh, let her take just a moment to kind of explain what that idea is and what role it might play in Ethereum governance. Okay, all right. So um, the clearinghouse, so, so if you Google clearinghouse, the first thing you'll see are like the financial clearinghouses, which is not actually what I mean. Those are places where trades get settled for securities. Um, what I'm talking about is a different kind of, an, of a clearinghouse, an information clearinghouse. Um, and this is something that a number of scholars in the United States and Europe have written about over the last 10, 15 years. Um, and they've identified sort of early stage clearinghouses in different kinds of contexts, like around EU governance or environmental justice. Um, and they tend to be suggested as um, possible, you know, recommendations or solutions in places where um, it, re normal regulatory structures are not working, um, often in areas where there are private and public interests that are overlapping, often in interests where there are sort of a number of diverse communities who are trying to, you know, who are engaged with the problem and they all have disparate priorities and they're not agreeing. Um, and, uh, and often in places where the, the, the problem at hand is actually really quite complicated or maybe even wicked. Um, and, and the best example I can see online of like an early stage clearinghouse that is really sort of step one is called the What Works Clearinghouse. Um, it's about educational policy and it was created by the Institute of Education Sciences. Um, and, you know, I, I want to say like it's really, it's sort of a, it, it's a starting point, it's a partial model, but if you were to look at it, what you would see would be, um, it's basically a, um, repository of information and really sort of draws on a lot of different studies as well as on educational experience from all these different schools across the United States about what works in, for example, teaching dyslexic second graders how to read or whatever, right? And so it'll, it, it combines the experience of all these different studies and lots of individual experience and does its own sort of um, review and, and, and analysis so that you get a quick, quick answer, like how do you manage your, you know, dyslexic second graders reading schedule or whatever. And then you, there's also the underlying um, information that's all there. So, um, so um, let me try and explain how um, it might actually work as a governance mechanism and how it could maybe be useful in a context like Ethereum. So, so clearinghouses often come up um, and, you know, they can be much more regulatory than the what works clearinghouse is. They can have all kinds of powers. You can build them however you want. Um, but the idea is really that this is a context where there's, it, where having a centralized regulator is not going to be effective because you're not going to have a centralized regulator who has enough access to information or knowledge or expertise. And that in fact, you know, the, the meaningful experiments are actually happen, happening on a decentralized basis with a lot of sort of local units which are actually doing the work and learning 
to learning and so on. And also that there's this sort of value in diversity and, and in sort of celebrating all of these diverse decentralized learning experiments and that you don't want to try and impose a top down uh, regulatory sort of um, load uh, because it reduces creativity and will just cycle both, you know, the diversity and the innovation of the experiments that are being taken, uh, that are being carried out. Um, but then meanwhile, if you have nothing but decentralized groups, um, you, you run into your own problems, right? Like there's no way for them to talk to each other, then um, every decentralized group can end up with a sort of lack of information, maybe it's reinventing the wheel. They may not have the expertise they need. Uh, the model ends up not being scalable, like you never sort of get anywhere um, and there are problems with record keeping and sort of collective intention and collective identity and um, so on and so the idea of a clearinghouse is really to reflect back practices from these decentralized groups back to themselves right so to sort of collect information from all these decentralized groups um, and be like a depository a repository for experience so usually in a clearinghouse there'd be somebody who can curate the information so people don't have it's not just like an information dump right it's not just a pile of content that people have to come through themselves um, and so it would require local units to produce information and give it to the clearinghouse that would be sort of like the you know the um, price of admission um, but then in return, uh, the clearinghouse would provide a bunch of analytics around, you know, benchmarking where people are at, what uh, best practices are, um, uh, and really sort of trying to understand uh, what's working, what's not, who may have prior experience with a particular problem that can be shared, and so on, um, in a transparent way, right? So again, they, they produce sort of insights, but all of the underlying information is still there, so you, you can look at the actual guts of it if you want. And you know, maybe in a way you can almost think of a clearinghouse as kind of like a rolling audit, right? Where it just sort of continually just reflects back experience and digests information coming up from these decision making groups. And you know, it's some of it it can be autonomous, it can be human, it can be a mix of them both. I mean certainly the ones so far that we have are human, but that doesn't mean they have to be that way. Um, and then depending on um, how serious you you know or how sort of comprehensive you would want a clearinghouse to be it can do other things so you can build it out so that it not only reflects back learning but can also be a place where you know it generates collective questions or recommendations or makes suggestions that you know group a talk to group b um, and the idea here is that you're sort of building an evidence-based like incremental decentralized decision making process where there's still all these running parallel experiments and you know and it's still i mean the idea of rough consensus and running code is really pretty consistent here right you're sort of building the boat in the middle of the river but there's a mechanism for like not rebuilding the same part of the boat over and over and over again and um and you know some of the literature talks about ways to create races to the top so that everybody makes more progress um but i think the the really important part of it is um uh, you know that that, in, that that all the decentralized units would have to be willing to, willing to share information. They'd be required to, right? They don't have to identify themselves. They could be anonymous or pseudonymous, but they have to be like willing to participate. And then the clearinghouse has to have the capacity to sort of roll that information back into collective learning. And then depending on sort of the will of the group the collectivity there's more that clearing houses can do right they can set broad goals they can set sort of regulatory requirements while still leaving sort of the detailed stuff to the more local units they can say okay as a group we are committed to the following things whether it's a code of conduct um, or whether it's like certain kinds of statements that could move liability off core devs or whether it's you know, some kind of capacity for building budgets for people because they don't want to have to build them themselves, they'd rather be coding. And you can build a clearinghouse however you want. Um, uh, maybe there could be conflict resolution uh, components in it. I mean, there are lots of different sort of possibilities, but the point is really that it's not like a centralized top-down regulator. Um, it's more of a sort of information gathering, but also synthesis and analysis tool which then, based on the fact that it's got that information, can do some other stuff. 
like set community standards if that's what the community would want to do. Thank you. That is super informative and super, super, super helpful. Um, thank you for that, that uh, very detailed summary. Um, I, I especially <laughs> like an idea you mentioned, which was, uh, sorry, a particular framing of this, which is kind of like a rolling audit. I think that's an interesting way to kind of think about the clearinghouse, um, but maybe it's also bi-directional. It's not just, um, it's more of a conversation, right? And not just, uh, just providing input one directionally. Yeah, for sure. I mean, ideally it's a conversation that can happen across sort of any set of, you know, the, the clearinghouse would want to be part of a conversation that happened between two other DAOs, for example, right. but anybody can talk to anybody. Um, I'm personally quite excited about this idea because I think in a space like Ethereum where we're kind of inherently suspicious of any kind of top-down, you know, dictatorial command and control style governance, um, something, a governance of, by, and among peers um, after this sort of a fashion, I think, has, has potential. Um, j just to, to kind of, um, you know, uh, just, just ask a question about this particular topic, Christy, if I remember correctly, you mentioned that one of the challenges of doing this in practice is often lack of resources, right? And I think that's interesting because we've sort of seen some proto clearinghouses in Ethereum. I think the Fellowship of Ethereum Magicians is a good example of one that's focused on things like technical governance. It's not explicitly a clearinghouse, but it could evolve into one. And yet it's already facing some of these challenges such as lack of resources. Yeah, super interesting. I mean, I, I, just as you were talking, I was thinking the same thing, that the um, Fellowship of Ethereum Magicians might be exactly the right place to start, you know, like they, they might be sort of the beginning of a clearinghouse around the technical stuff. And then, of course, that doesn't, that doesn't address the governance stuff. But yes, I mean, I feel like I've been, I feel like I've been doing this long enough to say that over and over and over again, lack of resources ends up being the reason why these clearinghouses as well as you know lots of other sort of well-intentioned things don't end up getting um, the traction that they need to right so it's super fun to build a clearinghouse but then you have to actually be serious about you know well, about a couple things right one about resourcing it properly so that it is actually providing value and you know it is able to ask smart questions and sort of move the needle right but then also um that it's got the resources to continue to learn from its own experience, right? So that it's also not just reinventing the wheel. Like if you want them to actually make, make a difference, then there has to be embedded in the clearinghouse its own mechanisms for like checking its own methods and making sure that it's still asking the right questions. And you know, you can't be complacent in that place any more than you can be complacent anywhere else. So yes, resources are huge. I was going to ask, um, are there any examples of uh, clearing houses that are currently in operation that we can look at or, or read about? So, yeah, I mean, I'd be happy to send you, um, there's, there's lots of academic work that talks about how this is, there are like proto clearing houses in a number of different areas, for example, around, you know, environmentalism in Chesapeake, Chesapeake Bay or around social services in Minnesota or around, you know, um, EU governance. But I think, I don't think anyone would say that any of them are actually um, fully functional in the way that they could be, which is why I mentioned this What Works Clearinghouse, because even though it's a little bit more humble in terms of what it's trying to do, it, it's not, it was built from scratch, right? And the problem with clearinghouses in a lot of different places is people try to grasp them onto existing legacy regu regulatory structures and um and it's just a really really hard graft it, you know the running a clearinghouse takes different skills than being a regulator being a you know being an effective contributor as a, in a clearinghouse requires you know different training different skills different mindset you're not a regulator and so i i think it's safe to say that most of the time those haven't been 100% successful, like we can learn from those examples, but um, in some ways it's exciting to imagine that in a place like the Ethereum ecosystem, because you're not dealing with those sort of those legacy systems. Oh, okay, yeah, uh, I, I was, as you were saying that, I was thinking we don't have those legacy regulation um, kind of regulatory bodies or agencies in place in Ethereum. So it could be a very interesting place to run this sort of experiment. Um, 
Thank you again. I mean, there's so much we can say about this topic, but I know we're, we're getting close to the two hour mark here. So I, I think we should move forward and conclude. Uh, and of course, we will explore this and other ideas a lot more in that report um, that we're working on, which, which I'm pretty excited about. Um, oh, there you go. Okay, so, <laughs> so our working group um, decided that uh, we'd like to share these findings as well as a bunch of other ones and suggestions um, in the form of a report that will discuss some of what we talked about today in this call. So kind of uh, taking a, a snapshot of and, and sharing some commentary on Ethereum governance today. Um, some of the risks that we perceive uh, that Ethereum faces and, and things we think could change, a clear set of recommendations um, and some proposals for experimental governance councils. Um, yeah, so anyone, so does anyone else, Christy or Phoebe or anyone else wanna add any commentary on what might go into this report or what these bullet points are referring to? I don't, I don't know if, um, you know, sort of what, what we might want to specifically mention, but I think there's room for like a, a lot of different possible tools and strategies here. So, um, you know, maybe there's a place for a code of conduct and maybe there's a place for, you know, um, a lot more work on diversity and maybe there's a place for sort of mapping out what the community has, um, uh, you know, it has appetite for and what it doesn't and so on. And, and so I, I really think of this as a really exciting starting point and hopefully it'll be, um, you know, a stimulating and product, provocative and productive one. Um, uh, but I don't know that it'll be the last one. <laughs> no, you, you raise a very important point here, which is, you know, a, a group of, of researchers or core devs or, 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 or some group of both can kind of go off in a room and have a whiteboard and, and sit down and write a set of recommendations. But, but really what it should be is, is a conversation. And it, it, it like, I, I guess this, this particular kind of conversation we're having now and the recording that we're gonna share of it is um, my first attempt to tie some of our work and our conversations back to the Ethereum community and get input from the Ethereum communities. But I'd love to kind of discuss more ways or kind of forums that we could um, uh, use whether they're existing conferences or whether we need to build something new to, to get that dialogue flowing back and forth because I think there's a great deal we can learn from one another and, and, and we need to kind of factor in the community response to ongoing work for sure. And uh, for, for those of you who are academics and researchers, I, I, I do think that this is, um, it could be a very exciting uh, source of uh, I don't know, of findings and discoveries and, and, and potentially very interesting um, articles about, you know, what's happening in, 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 in Ethereum governance and practice and things I'd love to contribute to as well. And I'm sure many others in the community would also like to contribute to. Uh, I think, all right, we made it. That's it. Thank you all so much for your patience and for sticking with this through two full hours. Um, we have four minutes left until the top of the hour. So any any other questions or anything we have, uh, I'd love to just open the floor and just spend those last few minutes uh, discussing anything you guys would like to discuss. Yeah, if I could, I have some very general remark on the very beginning, we tried analytically to make a distinction between governance of blockchain and governance by blockchain. But I think that actually, whenever we talk about values and norms, which go into the governance, those things are always go together, right? So those projects are built for some purposes to to, de to deliver some kind of values. And it would be kind of logical to expect that consistency between these values appears both in governance of blockchains and governance by blockchains. It's really hard to to leave it aside completely. Definitely. You know, it's funny, I'm working on an article uh, exploring this topic a bit more. And one of the things that I mentioned in that article is that these two related areas, governance of blockchains and governance by blockchains, I think kind of actually reduced to the same thing. It's really the same question um, about, you know, making decisions about how to allocate a set of resources based upon a set of shared, you know, values or goals or principles. Um, it's just that governance by blockchain builds on top of governance of blockchain. And so if you think about it as kind of in this sort of house of cards structure that I think about, you know, without that kind of stable foundation, um, I think it'd be very difficult to govern any big important things on a blockchain. Uh, it's also interesting to think about like 
could you have a set of values at the base layer, right? That, that I don't know, that, you know, put a great deal of emphasis upon participatory, you know, governance or whatever that contradicted a set of values used to govern something at a higher layer. That's an interesting question. Would they be compatible? I think maybe not. Yeah, it's, it's a very good topic to discuss. But you could have some kind of benevolent dictatorship, right? So which looks into the delivery of good liberal values for citizens. But I mean, the structure of government itself inside of it would be, you know, not very democratic, let's say, this kind of stuff. So it's, it's possible, practically. That's true. Yeah, in fact, now that you mention it, I think what probably needs to be emphasized at the ground floor, so to speak, the layer one is really things like stability. And I think that that is what Ethereum has wildly over optimized for, you know, at the expense of other things such as, you know, democracy or participation. And maybe you want to have those more participatory structures at higher levels. Uh, they're certainly easier at higher levels where there's less at stake. I think there's ongoing, you know, in, in a lot of areas where expertise is really required, there's this tension between wanting to get public input and recognizing that a lot of the time the public doesn't actually have the, you know, relevant expertise and can't contribute in really fundamental ways. And I'm sure that's especially true when it comes to things like this. Um, I guess, so I would say that when it comes to governance, like actually resource allocation decisions and um, and sort of things that have the broader implication, uh, you know, broader implication for the community. I guess I'm, my own view is I don't believe that there is ever such a thing as a benevolent dictatorship over the long run, right? You might start benevolent, but once you're a dictator, things go south. Um, and maybe the real trick is to try and find out, like to try and really articulate where the line is between the technical stuff, which can be done uh, sort of in a smaller uh, environment and the governance stuff where it really matters that people have input and that it be representative and um, fair. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, you know, it, it's, it, and, and it's a new question in Ethereum because historically it's been close to 100% technical. And I guess one of the points I'm trying to make is that that's changing and it will continue to change as Ethereum grows and evolves and this, you know, the base of stakeholders gets more diverse and their needs are more diverse. Uh, it, it's interesting because I think a lot of the questions we're facing, like I think uh, ProgPow, which we spoke about, um, is a great example of this. It's sort of 50% technical, 50% social. And I just don't know that you could very cleanly divide those two or what that might look like. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, we are, um, we're past two hours now. Again, I want to thank you all so, so, so much for, for, for sticking with this conversation for so long um, and, and for contributing so much, both uh, at the workshop last week as well as on the call today. Um, you guys are fantastic. I've learned so much from you and I'm, I'm so honored to, to be able to kind of uh, dig into topics as interesting and important to, to me and, and hopefully to you and the rest of the community as well together. Um, and I hope this is the beginning of a conversation. I'd love to do more of these in the future and you know have you guys share some of your deeper thoughts on these topics as well um so you can find me on twitter and i'm sure many of the others here as well uh, i'll share everyone's um, information if, if they want it to be shared along with this presentation and uh, look for the report which we're planning to publish by the end of june thanks for putting together a great uh, event lane it was really terrific Thank you so much, guys. Um, all right. Thank I you. Bye-bye. Am... Bye-bye. Thank Thanks, Lane. Bye. Bye.